Hello and welcome back to the workshop. I am Leita Winfield, Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry and the Division Chair for Natural Sciences and Mathematics at Spelman College. We're now moving into session two, which will be primarily held on Slack, an online messaging forum for sharing ideas and responding to discussion prompts. If you have not yet joined Slack workspace that is dedicated to this workshop, or if you have not yet read through the Slack guidance, please be sure to do so now before participating in this session. Links for both are found on the agenda. The mission of the Chemical Sciences Roundtables, or CSR, is to provide a science-oriented apolitical forum for discussing, for discussing chemically related issues affecting government, industry, and universities. In line with this mission, the aim of this workshop is to provide a forum for academic government and industrial colleagues to increase awareness of potential barriers to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and gain the information needed to create more diverse, equitable, and inclusive environments in their workspaces. The planning committee members felt that because this workshop is virtual due to health and safety concerns, another tool was needed to encourage and enhance community. To encourage and enhance community engagement beyond just a webinar or webcast platform. Slack provides a unique way for everyone in attendance to connect and come together to open dialogue and productive conversations around a set of topics. During this session, we will ask that you all focus on your conversations, focus your conversations into the seven channels named channel underscore and a number one through seven. There is a set topic of conversations and a list of goals for each channel. The topic and goals for the channels can be found in the Slack guidance document. Again, that is located on <clears throat> the agenda. Please do stay on topic in each of the channels so that the conversation can remain productive and we can move towards developing actionable and implementable thoughts and ideas. Planning committee members will be posting leading questions in the channels throughout the hour to provoke your thoughts, to provoke your thoughts and guide the conversation. Note that in accordance with the policies of the National Academies, the meeting organi organizers reserve the right to remove individuals from Slack workspaces at any point. Participants will be removed if the content that they post is disrespectful, offensive, lewd, or deemed counterproductive. Additionally, the organizers may reach out to you to delete the post if the content is not relevant to the channel you are posting in or relevant to this workshop in general. If you have any questions, please reach out in the, NA, in the NASEM support channel on Slack or email burlerich at nas.edu. The email is shown on the screen. We will all meet back on Zoom at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. At that point, we will hear from each of the planning committee members a brief summary of what was discussed in each of the Slack channels. Note that not all thoughts or conversations will be captured in this summary, but they will, but they may be captured in the published proceedings in brief or used for potential follow-on activities. At this time, and you can find the links to Slack on the agenda. If you haven't already registered, please do so as well as read the Slack guidance document, and we will move the conversation into the Slack channels at this time. Welcome back to Zoom. I hope everyone enjoyed using Slack and was able to engage in some meaningful discussions with other participants. We will now hear from each of the planning committee members who will summarize the conversation that, had, that was had in the channels that they participated in. Again, note that not all thoughts or conversations will be captured in this summary, but 
but they may be captured in the published proceedings in brief are used for potential follow on activities. Committee members, you have five minutes to summarize your discussions from the channel and we'll start with channel one, which was um, moderated by Cheryl. Um, we started out with very basic discussion of the definition of mentoring. Often we think we know what it is, but there are various perspectives on that one. We came to a consensus that the definition of mentoring is not well articulated in the literature. Some say that a mentor can be an advocate. Others say that mentors differ from advocates. Also, what does a mentor really do? Is it someone who gives advice or asks you, what do you think works best for you? Talked about choosing mentors. There was a consensus among the group that assigned mentors, and by the way, this is backed up with research, assigned mentors are ineffective, both in academe and perhaps in industry as well. Many students do not know how to choose a mentor. And I would say this is especially the case for underrepresented minority students. And some don't even know that they need a mentor. So what should, okay, so what should be done? First of all, um, graduate student associations have been effective in bringing together faculty and graduate students to interact on a regular basis so that they get to know each other and the choice can basically be mutual. Do they get along well enough to have that type of relationship? Um, okay. It was also suggested that we should consider mentoring an active aspect of training. And by that we mean we should block off time for mentorship in the same way that students are encouraged to focus on writing and reading, you know, blocking out time. Um, indeed, we might say that some students may need to learn how to identify relevant outlets for their writing. Topics we did not get to, the notions of concurrent versus sequential mentoring. And by uh, concurrent meaning, is one mentor at one point in time enough? Or you know, does one mentor, uh, is one mentor appropriate for all? Peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Some of these programs have proven to be very effective. And again, especially uh, with URM students. Talked about mentoring across sectors, academy, government, and industry, and um, the impact and effect of that arrangement. And finally, and we didn't get to talk about this one as well, the, and I don't mean this in a negative or pejorative way, but the burden of mentorship on URM faculty. You know, often faculty are encouraged to mentor underrepresented students. Uh, time is a zero sum game. This clearly takes away from their other uh, responsibilities as a scholar and teacher and I think this is especially the case with women, but perhaps that can be discussed at another time. So that was, that was our session. And I'm, I appreciate the input and impact. Oh, one more thing I meant to mention. Uh, we were talking about mentoring through professional societies, a program called Minorities Striving and Pursuing Higher Degrees of Success in Earth System Science professional development program. And what this does is to indeed offer access to a network of mentors from academia, government, and industry. And um, what it did was to, uh, it, okay, the person who uh, mentioned this said that the program lasted for two and a half years, provided funding to attend uh, to professional meetings and a tour of government agencies in DC. Um, they easily expanded their network by engaging with mentors outside of their university, and the program gave them a safe space to talk about issues that they're dealing with in their graduate programs. And uh, the person who suggested this said that they don't know if there's a similar program in um, 
other disciplines. So that is the end of our session. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect, Cheryl. Next, we'll have channel two, which is Jessica. Hello, all. So the topic of channel two was implementing proactive methodologies for success. Um, this was a bit of a quieter channel, but there was still some great points raised. So I will go through those. We started by discussing how one should define success and the participants of the channel felt that success should be defined by measurable impacts and by achieving set goals. The conversation then moved to discussing the resources available to new programs and initiatives um, and those resources that would be available to help them be successful and to not have to start from scratch and recreate the wheel. In addition to sharing some outside resources, the participants also shared advice for internal strategies and practices that one could implement. Also discussed was the idea of scaling up already established and successful programs. A participant shared that a national repository or database of programs should be created as we are not even aware of what others have tried. Multiple participants stressed that DEI work at an institution should be decentralized in order for an organization to increase their success. A participant suggested that having institutions publicly report their data and actions would lead to positive peer pressure in which other institutions would follow suit and begin to report their data. The importance of students joining local chapters of groups such as SOCNES and WCC was shared as those groups provide support in a variety of ways, increasing an individual's chance for success. It was noted that the student engagement with these groups has increased during the pandemic due to deep decreased costs of participating virtually, as well as other reasons. Um, it was raised, you know, whether or not this trend would continu continue post pandemic, but that of course is to be seen. And finally, um, right before we went to the to the report out, a great question was posed in the channel asking if it's even realistic for programs to be proactive when they spend so much time uh, sorry, if it is realistic for programs to be proactive when they spend so much time being reactive, uh, especially now that DEI is a hot topic in the news and so many institutions are, are being called out for one reason or another. Um, I think it would be great if we could at some point come back to the channel and continue um, the conversation and, and address that question. Um, but that that was the summary for channel two. Great, thank you, Jessica. We have channel three, Rigoberto. Uh, hello, Leita and everyone, thank you. Uh, so our channel was, the topic was overcoming institutionalized barriers to diverse talent. And I suppose that one of the things that is uh, common is that we need to create community. And so I'm happy to say that at least 13 of our members uh, said something about themselves and introduced themselves at the very start. And, and I think that's really key uh, for us to make progress. So I, I hope that um, all of you that are here are feeling yourselves heard. And I hope to continue that we'll continue to hear you uh, and your suggestions, because that's the only way we're going to solve this by working together to find these barriers. So the there was a recognition among the members of the group that we have barriers or challenges on the one hand for programs to create equitable spaces and on the other hand for individuals to enter and succeed in those programs. And that perhaps as we think about uh, this challenge or this question, we need to think about both sides of that. The, the one corresponds to what leaders can do and what leaders have to do to, uh, to modify their programs. And the other one is how uh, individuals can navigate that space along their pathway. So a number of, uh, there was some specificity. I think that if we had enough time, we would, uh, I could spend the entire half hour, but I'm only gonna have a couple of minutes. I'm just gonna give you a few examples. There's the issue of the lack of transparency. And, and in fact, uh, the existence of unwritten rules. And because of those unwritten rules, maybe only in-group members uh, know what it takes to succeed, what they need to succeed and out-group members are not uh, able to do that. The, what we heard about mentoring, uh, oftentimes mentoring provides a way to remove uh, the lack of access 
to unwritten rules, but perhaps the best thing to do is to not have unwritten rules at all. Um, and that led to an issue among some of the, our members about, well, how do we hold our, our, ourselves accountable to be transparent in our rules? Uh, how do we um, uh, let, let others know that we need to make some changes and to be open, et cetera? And there was a concern that in some cases, that the um, that when you try to be accountable and when you try to hold someone accountable, because that's another thing that uh, has been a barrier, that the the in group members or the leadership then uh, responds by saying publicly shaming you for that that we would be publicly shaming ourselves if we held if we were held accountable and we released information, and so it stops any discussion of releasing the numbers, which is something we've talked about before. And so perhaps we have to uh, move away from this shaming and, and really allow ourselves to uh, actually talk about the, the real problems and in that way be able to address them. The, another key idea that kept coming up was this idea of change, that uh, it's very hard in a, a shared governance uh, activities or in a shared governance domain or when there's leadership that doesn't necessarily buy in to this change to create and lead change. Uh, so one can try to look for incremental change, but that incremental change often involves compromises and can lead to policies that are ineffective. So for example, if we, if we all agree mentoring is important, what we just heard from the uh, channel too is that if you, if, if you assign a mentor, that's not necessarily effective because it doesn't actually create the relationship and trust that you need. So you identify what's needed, but you have a policy that doesn't work. How do we then fix that policy with a less than incremental change? And so, um, so I think that many of us wondered how to enact change in a, in a real way and how to work with change agents and manage that on the one hand to make it happen. And then finally, how do you communicate those changes? So you communicate those through your web, web pages, you communicate that through, um, through emails or through open forums, et cetera. How do you uh, communicate those changes? How do you obtain buy-in from the community now that that change has happened? So there are um, uh, both direct barriers, that is policies and procedures that are thwarting the success of individuals equitably. And then there are barriers to implementing the corrections. And so as we look forward to changing policies and procedures, really moving the needle through the policies that we're talking about at this uh, workshop, uh, those two, both the direct and the meta uh, um, parts have to be considered. And so I, I thank everyone in, in our group that contributed. There is a lot, uh, it's a very robust uh, discussion and I only expect that it will increase um, during the, the rest of the day. So I, I look forward to learning more from the team. Wow, thank you, Rigoberto. Um, Let's go to channel six, Ian. So yeah, so um, I had the uh, privilege of helping to moderate channel six. Uh, our topic was preparing young chemists and chemical engineers for success. So, uh, you know, I really build on a lot of the themes that have been emerging from the other channels so far. Um, and I'll say rather than focusing on, let's say, gaps in technical preparedness, right, that, that, that yield or result in success in the chemical sciences, um, we focused a bit more on perception, quite frankly, and sort of the, the call it the barriers to entry. Uh, and is thinking about barriers to entry um, and, and sorry, just to sort of back up, we looked at perception as sort of a big one there and sort of the uh, the extent to which students who are going through the school age years have the ability to see themselves as, um, you know, future scientists or future chemists in, in, in this particular realm. Um, and so that gets into elements of what we've already talked about before, which is uh, mentorship um, and certainly the idea of sort of demystifying uh, all elements of the process, right? So so what does becoming a scientist look like? What does uh, a chemist look like? Um, and, and, and not only that, but then what do the discrete steps of the process of getting there kind of look like? And how do we enable students to envision themselves uh, uh, participating in each step of that process? Uh, I think some themes that really emerged um, <clears throat> were really around the notion of, call it academic persistence or perseverance. Um, the notion certainly that, that research is a lot of getting it wrong until you get it right. And so how do we equip um, 
you know, students with call it the, the, the mental health skills or the perseverance to sort of call it whether those uh, uh, failures in the lab or otherwise are in the classroom, but to continue to try until they uh, achieve foundational understanding or a level of success that allows them to reach uh, their, their de degree goals or, or otherwise. Um, I think also there was, like I said, less talk about technical skills and more talk around, call it soft skills, um, effective communication, um, the ability to demonstrate critical thinking, especially as you look at getting uh, or, or pursuing career paths beyond um, your degree. So whether you're actually pursuing something in academia or something in industry, what becomes absolutely critical to, to landing that role. Um, and again, that gets into sort of demystifying what actually needs to be true. What are what are folks missing, especially in our underrepresented groups, um, that aren't allowing them to show up as perhaps more competitive or, or able to land those roles? Um, and sorry, just looking at notes. And if I may uh, just circle back to a couple of uh, either resources or, or things that uh, poked out as good examples. Uh, there was a, a book that was shared in terms of, call it the unspoken rules around how to be successful in graduate school uh, by Jessica Calarco, a, a field guide to grad school uncovering the hidden curriculum. So that was shared within our Slack channel. And then also a couple of good examples, again, about sort of pulling back the curtain, demystifying uh, the career path within the chemical sciences. There was a good example that was brought up, I'll say kind of within the bucket of, call it mentors and cohorts. Um, good example of some a STEM program in Atlanta where the, uh, the participant was deliberate in pairing 30 STEM professionals with STEM educators for a full year so that they could uh, more fully bring to life elements of their curriculum in the classroom to make it more real for students. And at the end of the day, it, it resulted in some real success for the students, not only some uh, increase in passion, but also some success in, in things like Rube, Rube Goldberg competitions, which I thought was really clever. Um, and then uh, also a great example about a chemistry festival, um, especially in, uh, I think this example was actually in a third world country. So how do you bring the idea of a scientific career path really to life for folks who, who maybe have no concept of it because they're struggling to even meet more basic needs on a day-to-day -day basis, but yet we still need those folks to be participating. And so another good example of, of how we're demystifying it, pulling back the curtain and bringing it to life. So lots of great discussion in the Slack channel. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's participation and I look forward to the uh, continued discussion there. So thank you. Thanks, Ian. We're going to go to channel seven now, which should be Carlos. All right, thank you, Lita. Uh, so our channel, channel seven, was actually communication, uh, communicating the benefits of a diverse uh, workforce. Essentially, it was actually a very active channel with a lot of uh, interesting insights and conversations and different threads. Uh, I would like to probably summarize that in three main questions that we asked and trying to answer and discuss. The first one was uh, related to how we identify the potential DEI benefits for any organization. The next ones were actually related to the challenges uh, that we have in communicating this and conveying these benefits, and as well as uh, you know what would be the best practices and strategies to effectively, com effectively convey these uh, benefits uh, to decision makers students, staff, and et cetera. And the last one was actually, we touched upon uh, uh, what would be the metrics of success in some of these activities. So it was actually very, very interesting to see different points of view from people from academia and industry and national agencies as well. Uh, regarding the, the, uh, uh, the benefits, I think uh, we came to the consensus that, uh, which is not a surprise for this group, is that uh, we think that the diverse pool of scientists and engineers lead to innovation and discovery. And that's probably the best benefit that you can actually convey to uh, managers and so on and so forth, uh, uh, you know, in different organizations. Beyond of actually being the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do as well. Uh, challenges, we did discuss a lot of those. I mean, for instance, uh, initially uh, uh, there's a participant that says, well, there is plenty of evidence that diverse teams are more generative, but academic chemists seem rather resistant to the message or are completely unaware of the data. Uh, so it seems to, that there's still some resistance among some members of the academic institutions to understand uh, the value of a diverse pool. 
Uh, so there is another comment for one of the participants that says, uh, among colleagues, there are those who believe that diversity and excellence are at odds with each other. Uh, another one says the selection of students and hiring processes are highly focused on excellence and they don't really account for other, other factors like uh, Lourdes was talking about uh, uh, yesterday, uh, about you know, economical factors, uh, societal factors, and so on and so forth. People that might actually be uh, very good scientists but do not have the opportunity because they haven't had the access to uh, uh, an opportunities that some other people have had. Uh, there was actually somebody from the uh, one of the na uh, national agency uh, and says, well, you know, uh, they, they, you know, they think that agencies see challenges in getting a competitive diverse pool of applicants. Often, uh, the more on the, on the representative candidates don't meet the minimum uh, posting requirements for the position, but the position is not an entry level position. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion surrounding that. I mean, uh, questions were, okay, can, can agencies actually work together with uh, 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 universities and trying to actually come up with, uh, 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 you know, minority institutions engaged with uh, uh, these uh, national agencies to see if they can have some kind of programs, official programs that can actually uh, help in this respect. And there, were, there was a lot of discussions about uh, how we could do that. In fact, uh, I know, for instance, uh, DOE has some programs already uh, uh, along those lines, uh, has been uh, very successful. I have actually met leaders at DOE that started from very small uh, schools around uh, uh, the country that would, were actually contacted by DOE and uh, were you know, part of these programs and they're actually highly successful leaders nowadays. So uh, there was a lot of discussions about that. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, I was told that DOE National Labs uh, uh, associated with minority service institutions and uh, South Carolina State University, Florida International U University, and so on and so forth. So there are programs there that can serve as models that we can look at and learn from. So uh, to actually try to uh, in improve in this, in this particular area, trying to empower uh, minority students uh, uh, to actually be better represented when they actually get hired. Um, so in terms of best practices, uh, there were a lot of discussions about that. And, uh, and you know, I'm trying to summarize some of those. I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, so one of those, uh, and it's actually related to what we were talking before about opportunities, uh, is actually, well, are there opportunities for innerships? In particular, innerships between, uh, you know, national agencies, uh, uh, un universities, colleges, uh, community uh, colleges, and also by industry. Right, so, uh, uh, and that's something that was highly discussed and uh, it seems to be one area where, you know, we can make progress to move the needle. Uh, of course, they will need, uh, you know, it cannot be just a, a sporadic effort. It has to be probably a coherent effort among different institutions and agencies and industries uh, that we can actually, so we can actually make an impact. But I think, uh, uh, I think in that respect, industry might actually be ahead of the pack and they're trying to do some of, uh, some of that already. And maybe we should actually learn from them um, uh, by interacting with industry a little bit more in these areas. Uh, another in, in areas of our universities, I mean, I've heard that some schools are implementing the strategies leading to uh, the uh, improvements, uh, reorganize entire climate diversity and equity inclusion uh, using uh, steering committees and so on and so forth. And that actually allows for accountability and also to increase the, 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 the environment. Uh, Thank you. I'll, Thank I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I will just uh, one more thing before I finish is actually uh, uh, regarding metrics of success. Uh, uh, most of the people feel that uh, the metrics of success that we currently have to actually uh, uh, gauge the success of our candidates uh, from the minority institutions are not good enough. Uh, and they don't seem to be, uh, adequate and equ equitable with other people. Uh, so, and I will leave it up to that, but there, there was a lot of stuff that I would like to cover, but I, I don't, I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We're gonna go to channel five with Malika. Thank you, Lata. 
I almost feel like I could yield my time back to Carlos because he has so much to say because Channel 5 was actually a pretty slow channel. The topic was broadening uh, the role of existing resources and networks. And so, you know, I had a couple of discussion points up on the board. Uh, one actually initially cross posted to the other channel and got a lot of responses regarding just the existing of different organizations that support DEI and the chemical sciences. And so that thread actually got a lot of um, input and information and you know as people are sitting if you didn't join channel five please pop in and uh populate it we just love to know what else is out there beyond the major ones like Novache and sacness and you know what other organizations exist uh, that doing dei work and uh chris banneke actually contributed that nogles app has actually recently uh can change your name to out to innovate and to be even more inclusive and gave us an updated link for that so I'm, that was one i was not aware of and so we're hoping to grow that uh the second question that was just asked is how do we grow and sustain networks uh, to do DEI work? And a lot of the discussion on that said that, you know, in fact, it's really the large organizations like AICHE and ACS that can drive this and that need to have um, diversity and inclusion as major thrusts. And we know ACS has come out and made statements to the fact that they actually value diversity, inclusion, um, equity and respect um, in, as a core tenant in their strategic planning and to just look at them to be drivers of this um, in the field, but both at the national level, but also at the local level. And I actually commented on my own experiences um, as an ACS counselor, which is really drawing from the local local participants and not very diverse. So we probably need more of a top-down push uh, through those networks as well. Um, the other question was, why is uh, diversity and in inclusion initiatives important to the organization? And some of the comments around that, we're just looking at ethical responsibilities and the fact that we also need to train all of our students to get them ready to tackle problems. And we also do need to increase the number of minoritized students who are in uh, these research labs to, to keep up with workplace and workforce uh, staffing needs. And so those were some of the discussion around that. Um, an interesting point that came up is that we need to also um, bring up DEI much earlier in education, that a lot of our discussions here are centered around the graduate enterprise, the college enterprise, the, you know, the, the job workforce activities, but to look at what can we do at the K through 12 levels to um, increase uh, diversity and inclusion in high school curriculum and even getting younger kids uh, trained. And I think that's actually a very important point that, um, you know, I feel like kids are just, they're just kind and sweet at birth and they learn to be biased and racist later. And if we can kind of get that intervention going earlier, I think long-term we'll save ourselves some trouble. So um, that was pretty much it in terms of the activity on the channel. The channel is still up active, channel five. If you didn't get a chance to check us out and wanna to add to our conversation, uh, please, please jump on some of these threads and, 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 uh, and, and fill this out. Thank you. Thank you for that, Malika. So we'll go to channel four, which is the channel that I facilitated on fostering inclusive classrooms and workspaces. And our goals were to identify effective strat strategies for fostering such an environment and figuring out how we can empower individuals on these campus to advance the culture of inclusion and, and adopt inclusive practices throughout the organization. So I summarize these into actions that organizations are currently taking and those actions that are still needed. So in terms of what's currently being done, individuals indicated that um, at the provost levels, initiatives have been established in connection with the teaching and learning centers to develop professional um, training and development opportunities related to DEI. There's also an expectation of DEI that is being assessed through tenure and promotion and performance reviews at some campuses. Other campuses indicated they don't have such criteria at this time, but would like to see something like that occurring. Um, some campuses are creating what's called equity action plans and others are utilizing climate surveys to gain feedback on where they are, as well as student insight related to DEI practices on campus. There are some organizations that have lunch DEI lunch chats or lunch and learn series. Um, others are creating committees at the departmental or agency level related to DEI. Um, some goals of these committees are to establish 
objectives for the key constituents, as well as related to actions and timelines and measures of success. So how does successful DEI practices look at each level, as well as promoting personal accountability for D DEI. And committees contain, can contain a range of constituents throughout the organizations. One participant wrote that for many companies, a key component to inclusion is the existence of performance management systems, which take into account, take, which take account of both what one accomplishes and how one accomplishes that. Um, Others are thinking about including guidance within faculty handbooks and organizational handbooks for employees. With that, the actions that are still needed include buy-in at higher levels of administration and leadership within organizations. One interesting comment that came up was a need to map networks that influence DEI to understand how those networks work and what is the impact of those networks on decision-making related to DEI. There's also a need for transparency related to training and promotion and pay and how those um, decisions influence or advance DEI. Funds are also needed for outside trainers and consultants to come into the organization and help create um, a narrative and language and actions related to DEI. And related to that, in general, campuses and organizations are in need of language that effectively describe what DEI is for an organization, how a culture of DEI would look, as well as providing guidance to constitu constituents on how they can achieve the expectations that are being set by their campuses and organizations for DEI. Um, such language currently is vague or either it's, it's not existent. Clarity is needed for um, or needed regarding how these efforts will be evaluated and accountability is needed beyond the DEI officer. So as we are hiring individuals to lead these efforts, we want to make sure that it just is not placed upon the appointee who's leading these efforts to make sure they come to fruition and are effective. We need to ingrain these efforts um, inside of our performance reviews, which I think has been said. One point that has was brought up that I didn't hear and others were, how do we effectively deal with bullying and other aggressive behavior? And we need to acknowledge and reward invisible or, or emotional work, which tends to be where most of DEI activities um, reside. And with that, um, I will stop here with my report out. I think we're, we have a break that's scheduled for 2.15 and we will return at 2.35 um, for our session three. So you're on break now until 2.35, at which point we will hear from Judy Kim from the University of California at San Diego. Thanks everyone for participating in the session and see you at 2.35.